Uh, I'm Eric Larson. I'm the Extension Court Specialist at Mississippi State. Uh, you see what the title is there. Uh, the focus a lot of this presentation is going to be on root development. Now, obviously, that's not a uh, hot topic for the most part, but it's a very important thing in terms of court productivity. And we'll start off. Um, I'll go through this very quickly. Uh, in Mississippi last year, our corn crop was lower, just like Perry mentioned in, in Arkansas. Um, yields were, were 10 to 15 percent lower for the most part. Dryland yields were more variable, and of course that's very dependent upon local rainfall. But I think we can all agree, I guess, in order to increase profitability, one of the things that we can do with the corn crop is enhance our yield potential. So there's more potential there to increase our profitability by increasing our yield potential than, than decreasing our input. So I think that's really where we need to focus. Now, Perry was mentioned about solar radiation. Here's some data that I've summarized over the last 20 years. I've been keeping a running total of this, as you see. Um, but one of the environmental factors that I feel has a, has a large influence on corn yields is nighttime temperatures. This is the average nighttime temperature, which is right at 70 degrees. And this is for the 30-day period following tasseling, the most important time period for photosynthetic energy availability for a corn plant. So last year, the nighttime temperatures were well above average. You look at over the past, it wasn't quite as high as 2010 and 11 there when yields were really depressed. Um, but the years that jumped out at you, 1998, the aflatoxin year where we had very low yields, 2010, 11, and uh, 2015 was not far behind. But it didn't surprise me anyway that yields were off a little bit last year. Um, in terms of management keys, um, Randy Dowdy mentioned this morning several different things, I guess, but, but a couple of things that everybody focuses on and we need to focus on for corn is optimizing that plant uniformity, not only in our um, how many plants we get up and what their plant spacing is, but the, the plant emergence uniformity and enhancing root growth and feeding that plant. Um, so I'll start out right here. Um, We've had certainly some very challenging planting conditions the last several years. A lot of variable stands, variable plant emergence, as you see there. And I'll put this up there kind of for a learning tool. I come across this after the planting season last year. Bob Nielsen, who manages and has a lot of the materials on the corn growers website, um, or the corn growers guidebook from Purdue, had this up there. And he kind of wrote this article in jest, but there's a lot of things that he has in this in this recipe that, that we can't control, I guess, as growers somewhat, um, or at least be aware of and, and manage our crop to avoid some of these issues. And, and these were the things that he mentioned. Uh, poor drainage certainly influences um, your ability to get a good stand. Um, soil temperature. Um, Randy Dowdy in his presentation this morning said he liked to have a soil temperature of at least 50 to 60 56 degrees in the morning at planting depth for at least three days prior to planting and a favorable forecast. The warmer that soil temperature is, the quicker that seed will come up, the more vigorous it will be and likely the more uniform that stand will be. So that's one thing we normally don't have to deal with a lot in the south, but over the past three years um, it has caused a lot of issues um, in, in the corn coming up slow and when you combine that with um, Wet conditions, uh, planting in, in conditions that are less than ideal, um, covering a lot of acres as quickly as possible in order to deal with the marginal or the limited number of days that we can get in the field and plant, that's where we have a lot of issues. And you add rain after planting and uh, even pre emergent herbicides and other pest issues can cause a lot of problems. So there, if you look through that list, about everything except for the, the saturating rain after planting, we can have a little bit of control over as producers. So certainly some key things to think about. Um, and you know, obviously early planting is an important and critical thing for corn production, but doing achieving early planting at the expense of a uniform stand also causes a lot of a lot of reductions in overall yield potential as well. And uh, corn is a crop that you start with the yield potential here and you have any hiccups during the season, the yield potential is dropping every time you have an issue. So you don't have the ability to influence that crop during the year or build 
something back into it if it's not there from the front end. You've got a determinant crop that basically has one ear or one piece of fruit on it that you have to work with. Um, another some of the things that, that we saw a lot of issues with last year in Mississippi, a lot of fields had these tire traffic patterns. I don't know how well that shows up, but pretty visible difference in terms of color right through here. If you look closely at a lot of the fields, and this was from one side of the state to another, um, you see these patterns every every 12 rows or whatever the planter width was across the fields where you certainly see the tire tracks there, a lot of stunning um, in those tire tracks compared to the normal crop. Um, so a lot of yield reduction there. This is not something that the crop is going to grow out of during the year. Here's another field of harvest time. Again, you see that, that stunted height at that portion of the field or in that in those tire tracks. I've been a whole lot of talk about this that you know we're seeing more and more of that all the time is these tool bars get heavier and heavier um, and they're consistently using RTK going over the same roads. What are people doing about that that they're more successful? I don't know if there is a whole lot to do different. Um, you know obviously maybe use some some fall tillage if it is you know if you develop hard pans with traffic during the year um, either during the early part of the season when the soils are wet or during the harvest season if you're getting bean crop out late or something like that and get into some muddy or wet conditions. Uh, using some fall tillage, some deep tillage here in the fall would help. Um, what, what's the history on that? What's in that field for corn? I don't know about that. We just have to see that. No till or till? No. I, I doubt it. I doubt it. Our, our guys, we do see this year over here, our guys get a lot more focused on what that calendar date says than the field conditions. And that, that's that's where we run into that problem more so than anything else. This year it just happened to be a lot worse than normal, and it rained all March. Yeah, so it, when it finally yeah. when it finally dried out, basically the last couple of days of March, first of April, I mean everybody just <coughs> went yeah, crazy. crazy basically, let a tractor with a planter get on the highway and drive through and then shine. By that afternoon, there'll be five more planters in the field somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> but. Just pointing out that you know that corn is is not tolerant of issues at planting time. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of various things that we can focus on to do a little bit better anyway. And here's another field, I guess, that shows the effect of that. Just shows the extensiveness of the problem. Um, all the stripes right there through the field are basically tire traffic patterns. There's uh, serious problems with nitrogen deficiency in that field. Um, soil compaction and other things related to that. So uh, definitely something that caused a lot of serious yield reduction. Here's another thing I guess that we see a lot of in Mississippi and in terms of, of water management, irrigation, um, wilting is something that we're, you know, taught I guess that, you know, obviously we don't want that corn stress at any point during the year, but when we see that lots of times, um, we jump to conclusions which aren't necessarily true in all cases. And if you look closely right here, what do you see right there where the arrow is pointing on the soil? There's plenty of moisture right there, but that crop is wilting. Um, so eight out of 10 growers are probably gonna run out there and be ready to turn on their pivot or turn on the irrigation system the next day. And that's not necessarily the problem in this case. So corn is very apt to wilt um, during the vegetative stages, um, a lot of this wilting is occurring because the corn doesn't have a very good root system underneath it at this point because it has been saturated and wet and had temperatures that are extremely cool up to this point. And uh, corn during the, the vegetative stages will wilt, wilt very readily. Um, when you have a dramatic temperature change from you know 70 low 70 degree temperatures to 85 degree temperatures. The corn will wilt readily in the afternoon. You can just count on it. So don't freak out over the fact that it's wilting a little bit because um, a lot of your root development is occurring um, during those stages. Um, about 75% of your root development occurs after the corn is about waist high or so. So if you go out there and, and irrigate as soon as that crop is, is starting to wilt a little bit, regardless of what the soil moisture conditions are, you can have a dramatic restriction, certainly in the depth and development of that root system that will ultimately help you out later in the year. 
So how do we determine proper irrigation initiation? This is a, something that obviously is, is high priority, um, something that we have a lot of anxiety about during this part of the year. Um, what this chart is showing, I guess, is the amount of yield reduction associated with water deficits during different parts of the growing season on a corn plant. We all know how sensitive it is to water deficits during the, the early reproductive stages, but during the, the vegetative stages, clear on up to, I can't see exactly what that is, what that exact line is on right there, but corn that's well up above chest high or, or up in the shoulder high range, um, it's not going to lose a whole lot of yield potential during that time period. Um, its water use is relatively low and its sensitivity is low. And there's actually some research and on the Pioneer Growing Point website, there's an article called uh, Safely Delaying the First Initiation, or Safely Delaying Irrigation in Corn, something to that, that title anyway. But uh, there was some research at Kansas State done over a long time period that basically showed that water stress during this time period, if you have irrigation that relieves that prior to tasseling, really have no yield reduction whatsoever. So keep that in mind that your, your irrigation needs during this time period are relatively low and actually the excess of irrigation or, or continuing to keep those soils saturated during that time period can have some negative impacts on crop development, particularly root development and uh, even ear, ear size development as well. Um, this is a slide I just want 75% of that uh, root growth is determined during late vegetative stages, so you can, can restrict root development, um, promote nitrogen loss, and actually, if you're using soil moisture sensors, most of the time during this part of the season, we have plentiful moisture, any, even as, as shallow as 12 inches deep, so it doesn't take a whole lot of irrigation water. It's very rare, I think, in most cases where we actually need to be irrigating until that corn crop gets, uh, you know, probably in the B12 type range where the corn is getting on up there about to get higher or taller. Um, and I'm throwing this slide in there. I didn't have this in, in there previously. I just don't want to put, add this in there today. Um, the kernel rows per year are the first yield component that's determined in a corn plant. And the data represented here is from our corn demonstration program, which is where we take, it, it's basically our county trials, where we take the best performing hybrids in the state hybrid trials, plant them in strip trials all around the state to generate additional yield data and look at plant characteristics. One of the things we do is I send my graduate students and student workers around, they sample the ears and get the yield components, including the number of kernel rows per ear, how many kernels per ear there are, and what the kernel weights are, along with the yield data. And you can see there that irrigated corn actually has a lower number of kernel rows per ear than what the dry land corn is. And so obviously the dry land corn is in, under no more stress as a general rule than what the irrigated corn is. And this is true not only for 2015, same data is basically true as a tenth better for the dry land fields in uh, 2014 than what, than, as well. So it's, uh, I actually look at you know, excessive soil saturation during those vegetative stages as being one of the main things that can hold back our, our yield potential. And actually the last couple of years, you know, Randy mentioned it I think, and Perry maybe mentioned it in his program, but uh, a lot of what we've seen is, is a lot of our lower yields are coming in areas that we know are, are prone to hold water or low areas in the field that stay saturated. Um, we do have tools now to better monitor soil moisture. If you haven't used soil sensors, soil moisture sensors, I would encourage you to use them. Uh, they're a great tool that obviously tell you what your soil moisture levels and provide some actual numbers for you to work with. Uh, they'll tell you what your soil moisture is in different depths of the soil and actually tell you what your effective rooting depth is too. Uh, before we started using these, we really did, didn't know what our effective soil rooting depth was. Um, you know, um, 
talked to several consultants and they thought, you know, there's really no need to put these soil sensors in any deeper than 18 inches. And what we've been seeing is that we can see that roots routinely are using soil moisture once the plant gets fully established as deep as 24 inches. And really, I, I, I think that if we do a better job of managing our irrigation, uh, managing hard pans and soil and so forth, that in most cases and in, in our best managed fields, we're seeing that soil moisture or the, the rooting depth and soil moisture has been used as deep as 36 inches. So that's very important. Not only does it give us a more of a fudge factor, you might say, more resources to utilize not only for water but nutrients as well. Lastly, I'll finish up. The other time period during the year where we have some opportunity, I guess, to uh, manage the water closely is not only on the front end of the season when our uh, needs are low, but at the tail end of the season, as that plant gets more mature, it becomes much more um, resistant to deficits or stress as well. It basically mobilizes energy out of the rest of the plant much more efficiently and will not have as much yield reduction from late season stress as well. Um, and I'll show an example, I guess. Here's an example of a, of a one of our corn verification fields um, shows the chart of what the soil moisture sent, soil moisture level is doing as we approach physiological maturity. I want you to focus out here. Um, this is a field where we knew that we were going to have a, a close call on that last irrigation. The, the farmer watered the crop and it was time to water it when it was about 15 days prior to physiological maturity. Um, we knew that that soil moisture probably wouldn't carry us all the way that 15 days or it'd be very close. So right here, we are about a week from physiological maturity. Um, and uh, that's the last week as we approach, that's a week in timetable. At this point, we were five days away from physiological maturity. Um, the key line that we have here is during the season, we were basically <coughs> using the 75 centibar level as a threshold for triggering irrigation. And this was at the 24 inch level in the soil. The soil, left, the soil moisture level at shallower depths was, was already depleted much more severely, but we did have some soil moisture at 24 inches. The crop was using it there. Um, we would like that we had uh, roots a little deeper, so it was actually using soil moisture from 36 inches too. But these numbers and this sort of data can help us make a decision. Um, the first thing I would do is be conscious that that level or this threshold level for irrigation does not necessarily need to be constant during the entire growing season because of what we've been seeing in that chart that has the, the big hump in it during the middle it looks like that. As we approach physiological maturity, we can deplete that soil moisture level much lower and actually the, the fellows out in the drier areas of the United States use uh, levels in the 125 to as, less, to as low as 150 um, with their irrigation scheduling. So I feel very comfortable knowing that I have soil moisture here. It's depleting at this level. It's just, just going to be a little bit below 75 centibars when we're five days from physiological maturity. So I feel pretty, pretty comfortable at this point not irrigating one last time when we're only five days away from physiological maturity. But um, anyway, this is a tool that, that can allow us to use some science, use some technology to make better decisions. Um, and this is one of the times that it is quite useful there at the end of the season as we approach physiological maturity. So with that, I happened to give my daughter a phone one day when we were out in the duck hole and uh, she took a little selfie here, I guess, that I found out several days later. But uh, they certainly have plenty of questions for me, so if y'all have any questions, I'll, I'll try to answer for you if you have any. Harry, you're not saying you know, we don't see the water early or the final time. Yeah. Um, you know, once again, I'd like to use the soil moisture to see what we have in the profile. Um, but our, our strategy during the season, depending upon where we're at, needs to vary depending upon the crop growth stage and what we have in the soil, basically. We don't need to freak out the first time that, that 
crop wilts a little bit, you know, particularly if it's you know, less than waist high. system is not very deep that time of the year uh, but uh, we've got plenty of soil moisture in the profile and y'all know I guess you've all heard it or said it I guess many times if you're a grower too but we don't want to fall behind but the likelihood of falling behind when we've got soil moisture that's six or eight or nine or ten inches deep certainly 12 inches deep is not as great as what is perceived sometimes too so just be aware that there is some negative consequences associated with that first irrigation timing and you know some of the things like we saw that that example that i showed the last slide that you know the roots only got down 24 inches deep we argued with that farmer back and forth and talked several times a day and and uh, he wanted to water when the crop was about 24 inches tall and wilted up um, and uh, actually went ahead and watered and then it set in raining for about three weeks after that time. And uh, that was one of the reasons why his, his root system never got deeper and, and utilized. Never got deeper than 24 inches. 2012 we got rain. It didn't rain. Yeah. 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 Eric, in, in the in season water use, you're talking about monitoring effect fruiting depth by uh, where it's pulling more from. Yeah. I know that varies by soil size and whatnot, but have y'all seen, I mean, I've had the product most directors fruits, have you seen a difference in effect fruiting depth by population on more on the product on any of it? It's across all the product in population. Yeah, I don't know if we've really looked at that or, you know, that would be something that we could look at I guess but it's not something that normally we have an opportunity to evaluate because we don't have enough moisture sensors in the field you know or have variants of that in plant population to look at but what I do see I definitely there's a, a huge influence of growth stage uh, and uh, you know anytime it rains during the growing season you hear they Where the roots are utilized, the moisture is going to utilize it in the top first and uh, work its way down. Any more questions? We're already on the time. I'll stay here as long as y'all want. But, uh,